Well, good evening. I want to welcome you here this afternoon. I say evening, afternoon. I'm not sure what it is, but it's 5 o'clock somewhere. So thanks for being in the class tonight. And I know for several of you, um, um, this class has been, been a little bittersweet, but um, and others are thinking, why are we still doing this? So uh, it's sort of late in the season to change streams, so we're, we're going to proceed on with our class on Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. And um, tonight we're going to take a look at the Nile River and Coptic Cairo, and you may wonder, well, what is Coptic Cairo? I hope you'll have a little bit better understanding about um, um, Coptic Cairo and the Coptics in general. Um, but tonight as we get started, um, we'll talk about the Nile River just a little bit and how it plays its role in the Bible. And the Nile River flows right through the city of Cairo. It's sort of like the Cumberland River flowing right through, you know, the middle of Nashville. Um, there's a lot of traffic on the Nile River. Um, primarily it's smaller craft and, and consisting of sailboats and these little river cruise boats where you can go out and take a dinner cruise if you want to, and entertainment boats, and, and some small commercial boats carrying a variety of goods and materials. We had an opportunity to take a Nile, dinner, Nile River dinner cruise. Um, that, that was an option that was available for the group that was going to go over there. Um, but I decided it would not be worth doing for two reasons. Um, one, um, it's wintertime, so it would be dark earlier. You really wouldn't get to see much of the city. You'd see the city lights, um, and that could have been interesting. But second, I didn't think some of the entertainment on these dinner cruises um, over there would be too appropriate. Um, so had we gone, we wouldn't have done that. We would have saved our $75 a person and enjoyed a dinner at the hotel that night. But with a population of 22 plus million, and I didn't realize Cairo was that big of a city, um, but it is, there are many bridges that cross over the Nile, and our hotel accommodations were on the west side of Cairo in the suburb of the 6th of October city. Now, that seems to be an unusual name for a community, the 6th of October city. But when I saw the name that w where we were to stay, I had to look up the significance of that name. Now, for several of you, you probably know exactly the significance of the 6th of October. And um, it was the 6th of October, 1973, when the Egyptians and Syrians launched a surprise attack on Israel. And without going into a lot of detail, Israel had taken control of the Sinai Peninsula in an earlier conflict with Egypt, and Egypt wanted it back. In 1973, Yom Kippur was being celebrated on the 6th of October. In the Bible, Yom, Yom Kippur is known as the Day of Atonement. And with Yom Kippur being one of the most holy days of the Jews, of the Israelites, um, they were caught off guard when Egypt and Syria attacked. Initially, Egypt gained ground, but Israel fought back, and with the assist assistance of the United States and Paul Norwood, I guess, <laughs> um, they regained the territory that Egypt had taken. But oddly enough, Egypt, even though they lost that, they still consider that conflict to be a victory. They were driven back, and, and it forced them into calling for a ceasefire. But even today, Egypt celebrates the 6th of October as a big holiday for them. And um, so they lost the conflict, but they were successful in the long run as it led to a diplomatic solution. Do you know what that diplomatic solution was? The Camp David Accords. I mean, you probably are familiar with, with that. In 1978, a peace agreement at Camp David with Jimmy Carter, 
Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin was negotiated where Israel would withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula and return it to Egypt. And now some 50 years later, on the 7th of October, Hamas has led a similar surprise attack on Israel. Um, and so it's because of that, we're not going to Egypt and Jordan and Israel. And um, so anyway, that's, that's that. A couple of weeks ago, Bob showed us the pyramids of Giza. Uh, and the pyramids are located on the west side of the Nile River where our hotel accommodations were. After visiting the pyramids, we would have crossed over the Nile River on our first um, tour day to visit the Egyptian Museum um, that Bob talked about um, a couple weeks ago in the old Coptic Cairo area. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Is there anything special I got to do to move the slide? It's, well, maybe it's not. That would help. Yeah, here we go. It helps. So when crossing the Nile, we would have seen these buildings shown on the slide. Um, the tall, skinny structure is called the Cairo Tower. Paul mentioned in the first class that he went up in this tower when he was in Egypt with the Air Force several years ago. Um, today it's an, a, a tourist attraction, and when it opened in 1961, it was the tallest structure in all of Africa. It no longer is the tallest structure in Africa, and not even the tallest structure in Cairo. Um, the dome structure just to the right of the Cairo Tower, uh, maybe not. Well, anyway, there is a Cairo Opera House. So who would have figured Cairo would have had an opera? And the larger round tower to the right of the screen, and this looks like it's backwards or something, yeah. Well, anyway, there's a hotel in there, too. <laughs> I don't know what's happened with my slide. But the Nile River in Egypt is not mentioned in the Bible as often as the Jordan River or even the River Euphrates, but it did play a huge role in the history of Israel. Most of the time when I think of the Nile River, I think about Egypt. Um, and the Nile certainly is prominent in the country of Egypt, but it is also the longest river in the world. It touches some 10 African nations on its way to the Mediterranean Sea. The source of the Nile River is generally considered to be Jinga, um, Uganda. And I think um, Bob mentioned um, a couple weeks ago that some of us that have gone to Uganda on mission trips have, have been out on Lake Victoria where that where you've seen the water bubbling um, with the springs in Lake Victoria. And um, there are several other tributaries that feed into the Nile River as well. Um, but generally, um, Jingo, Uganda is considered the source of the Nile. Here is another picture of Cairo and the Nile River. And from this vantage point, it's possible that this structure could have been taken from the Cairo Tower. Here's another picture showing the Cairo Tower. Um, it is said that next to the pyramids, the Cairo Tower is the second most recognized landmark in Egypt, in Cairo. Having mentioned earlier that the Nile River is the longest river in the world in terms of the volume of water flowing in it, it is not as large as the Mississippi River, and it is much smaller than the Amazon River um, in terms of water flow. The Nile River is just not as deep or as wide as the Mississippi or the Amazon. And to some extent, uh, Cairo reminds me of New Orleans. You know how the Mississippi River flows into New Orleans and then it goes out into the Delta? 
Well, the same thing is true with the Nile River in Egypt. It flows northward instead of south, and it opens up into this fertile delta area before it empties out into the Mediterranean. But as you get further away from Cairo, you'll start seeing residential housing and farms along the banks of the Nile. And because of the annual flooding that occurs, there's a lot of silt that is carried by the river to the rich delta near the mouth of the river, making it excellent for farming. Outside of the Nile River Valley and the Delta area, Egypt is primarily desert. I got to looking on, on, uh, at the maps last night where we were going to stay in, in Egypt. Um, it's not very far from the hotel that you go directly from being a city to being desert and just being sand and being desolate, nothing there at all. If you've been down to Florida, you know if you <clears throat> have been over the Fort Lauderdale um, um, primarily and you head um, west in Florida, there's an immediate demarcation between land and, um, oh, what's the swamp area down there? Everglades. Everglades. If you've ever flown over to there, you can see the Everglades as you fly into Fort Lauderdale, fly into Miami. But um, there's a, a strong mark there dividing the two. And you find the same thing in Egypt between what may be habitable and what's inhabitable. So as such, about 95% of Egypt's population lives within a few miles of the Nile River today. Here's another picture of some of the cows grazing down by the river. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in this class um, um, looking at baby Moses and his rescue by the daughter of Pharaoh. There is considerable debate over which Pharaoh was in power at this time, but we do know this Pharaoh in the Bible cruelly attempted um, to reduce the Israelite population. First, he made the work of the Hebrews more difficult and bitter. He figured if he made the Hebrews miserable, they would not prosper as much with the additional children. That didn't work. Second, when Pharaoh saw that hard work led the Hebrews to having more children, not less, he ordered the midwives to kill all the, ma all the males as they were born. Two midwives with, Hebrews names, with Hebrew names shrewdly told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were strong and gave birth before the midwives could get there, and so they couldn't kill the male babies. Um, the population of the Israelites continued to increase, and I think it's fitting in, uh, that the names of these two midwives, Shifra and Pua, are named in God's book for all of eternity. We know who they are, but we have no idea who this Pharaoh is. He's just Pharaoh. Um, two lowly Hebrew women who feared God were able to outwit this mighty ruler of Egypt. Exodus 1.22 speaks of Pharaoh's final attempt to suppress the Hebrews. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people... Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now Pharaoh's desired motive to kill the Hebrew babies was to remove a threat he perceived the Hebrews held over the Egyptians. The population of the Hebrews was growing so large they were afraid that if they ever turn against us, we probably could lose to them. And that was one reason why he was wanting to eliminate the male population is uh, to get rid of this perceived threat. Little did he know that they really didn't want to stay there anyway. They were ready to leave. But he wanted the slave labor for his building projects. And this is not the last time a killing of Hebrew babies occurs. Do you, know when, uh, do you remember when another killing of Hebrew babies happened by evil ruler? Herod. Herod, yes. He, yeah, all the children under two years of age were to be killed. Again, removing a perceived threat. He had heard that there was a king that had been born, 
and he wanted to eliminate this king before he could really become the king. Um, Herod, like so many others, had a, had a wrong idea of what this king named Jesus was to do. Many innocent babies were put to death by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And a day would come when the Egyptians would sow what they reaped. When God struck Israel, e struck Egypt with the tenth plague, every firstborn Egyptian son was killed. Exodus 2 of Exodus continues the narrative of the Egyptian attempt to reduce the population of Hebrews by killing all the newborn male babies. It is here we are introduced to a surviving baby who rose to become one of the greatest characters in the Bible, Moses. So let's read some, some scripture from Exodus chapter 2, and we'll take a look at the first 10 verses of Exodus 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, where our young women um, walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Family lineage was particularly important to the Israelites. So here it is noted that Moses came from the tribe of Levi. Later in Exodus, we learn that the priests and those serving in the tabernacle, and later on when the temple was built, they were to come from the tribe of Levi. In fact, Aaron, Moses' older brother, would become the first high priest for the people of Israel. Moses' mother, later identified as Jochebed, did the best she could at keeping her baby son. But as Moses grew older, it became increasingly difficult um, to keep him concealed from the Egyptians. As a last resort, she made a wicker-type basket made of bulrushes and covered it with tar and pitch, placed baby Moses in the basket, and set it out to float on the Nile River. Can you see a little bit of an irony in this action? Pharaoh commanded all male babies be thrown into the Nile River to destroy them. But here Moses' mother puts them in the Nile River to save him. Moses' mother further instructs her daughter Miriam, Moses' older sister, to watch and see what would happen to him. Another thing to note about this basket and I always hate to say these things with a Hebrew scholar in the audience. Um, but the word basket in Exodus comes from the Hebrew word Theba or Teba. Um, this word is used in connection with only one more event in the Hebrew Bible, and that's with Noah's Ark. So in a sense, Moses was put in an ark, um, just like Noah and his family were put in an ark. And both the Ark of Noah and the Basket of Moses saved lives and started new beginnings. We see that the basket, while floating among the reeds, was seen by the daughter of Pharaoh. 
After having her servants retrieve the basket, she looked inside to find a baby in it, a Hebrew baby. The baby was crying, and the daughter of Pharaoh had pity on him. The Bible does not inform us of how old this daughter was or what her name was. You know, you don't know if she was, oh, this is like a new puppy I found. You know, let's, I want him, you know, or if she was older daughter. Um, but the daughter of Pharaoh decided to, by proxy to raise um, Moses as her own child. Um, she gave her Moses unknown back to his mother who nursed him until he was a little older. And then Moses was brought to the house of Pharaoh. But you got to wonder what her daddy, Pharaoh, thought of this idea, trying to get rid of all these male babies. And here I am bringing one into my own, my own house here. Um, so Jochebed was able to continue nursing him and got paid to do so. And babies in those days were not weaned as early as they are today, so Moses' mother may have had him for, for a few years before turning him over to Pharaoh's daughter. And it's during this time Moses undoubtedly learned of his heritage and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the promises God made to them. <clears throat> Pharaoh tried his best to keep Israel from multiplying, but failed in his attempts. Moses could have been one of the thousands of male babies born that year, but because Pharaoh commanded that all of them be killed, the one baby who survived would be the one who would lead his people out of Egypt. And not only that, this one male child grew up in the house of Pharaoh right under his nose. Um, mention of the Nile River in the Bible is not limited to the book of Exodus. The Nile is mentioned in Genesis where the Pharaoh of that time had a dream of standing on the banks of the Nile where he saw seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. Um, Joseph was able to correctly interpret Pharaoh's dream saying that the seven fat cows represented seven years of good crops and these seven good years would be followed by seven years of famine. Later in Exodus, in Exodus, in chapter 7, we see the Nile River in association with the ten plagues. In the first plague, God turned the water of the Nile River into blood. Um, we may read that and just continue without thinking, well, he turned some water into blood. Well, it was the Nile River. Remember, through ten African nations there, the longest river in the world. Um, but it had to be incredibly gross. <laughs> to see your water supply turned into a stinking body of blood. In the next chapter in Exodus, we read of God sending the plague of frogs to cover the land. And this swarm, swarm of frogs is said to have come out of the Nile. The Nile is mentioned a few more times in the Old Testament, primarily by some of the prophets. The Nile is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament, although Egypt is mentioned several times. Now we're going to transition over in the Coptic Cairo, so we'll make a quick departure from the Nile River and go into Coptic Cairo. Coptic Cairo is, if you've been to, into historical cities, um, maybe um, um, well, the city in um, Florida that's so old, St. Augustine, you know, they've got an old area of the city. If you go into um, San Antonio, you can go into an old area of the city in San Antonio, and there's other um, cities like that too. In Egypt, the old city it consists of, um, well, I'm sure it's a, guy at a larger area, but it's primarily Coptic Cairo that is most well known. The landmarks are well known there. And, um, and so we're going to look at some of the history and some of the religious practices of Coptic Christians and some stories of fantasy that have come out of Coptic Cairo. We will also look at biblical truths which we can be assured in comparison uh, to some of the stories that have developed um, there over time. Coptic Cairo sits in an ancient area known as the Fortress of Babylon. Uh, the Fortress of Babylon has nothing to do with the Babylon in the Bible, has nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, uh, 
but it was a fortress originally built in the early the mid first century by the Romans. A newer fortress, call, also called the Fortress of Babylon, was later built closer to the Nile River some 500 years later. So this is the new fortress compared to the old fortress. And um, Coptic Cairo sits on about 20 acres of land on the east side of the Nile River in the middle of modern Cairo. The original walls, and let's see if I can... Yeah, you see the, some of the original walls that, that go around Coptic Cairo, and, and they encircle the area. It's all closed in. Um, they still stand, and over time, buildings, mostly churches, have been constructed within the walls. Any guess as to how many churches are within the walls of this um, Coptic Cairo on 20 acres of land? Well, there's at least six churches in there. Um, you have the Hanging Church, the Church of St. Mary, the Church of St. Manus, the St. Barbara Church, St. George Church, and the St. Sergius and St. Bacchus Church. In addition to the churches, you have one Jewish synagogue. And you might be surprised, a Jewish synagogue in Muslim Egypt? Yes. And there's still a, a, a number of Jewish um, residents in, in Cairo. Um, that synagogue is called Ben Ezra, and it's located within the walls. In addition to the churches and the synagogue, there is a museum and three cemeteries. And you can also find an old Roman military tower in the compound. I uh, see. Well, I'll go back one side. Uh, the building you see there with the dome on the top, that's a picture of St. George and the fortress walls in the foreground. On this slide here, there's a picture of the Roman military tower. And the tower itself is part of the wall. So um, not only is it the, the, the military tower where they would have maybe housed people and stored supplies, things like that, it is part of the wall. Um, if you went um, to Israel with us a few years ago and saw the, the wall of Jerusalem, there's towers built into that wall as well. And some of the, the buildings are, are part of the outer wall as well. All right, I believe this is a picture of the Coptic Museum, but I'm not absolutely certain. And the reason why I say that, so many of these buildings look alike. Um, particularly on the inside. But this is an exterior picture of St. Sergius and Bacchus Church. And this is an interior picture of the Hanging Church. It's beautiful inside, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and if you were to look at interior pictures of the various churches in, in Coptic Cairo, you would notice that some of the interiors are very similar. And I had the the look very closely determined this was not St. Barbara's Church. And I'm trying to, there was something that gave it off. I think it was the, um, uh, I think it was this right here is different between the two churches, but the architecture is pretty much the same in both of those. All right, any idea what this um, mosaic in one of the churches, I think, I think it's in St. Sergius Church. Anyone know what this mosaic represents? Pardon? Elijah. Elijah. Elijah? Nope. Jacob. Nope. Jacob. Not Isaiah. Jacob. Not Jacob. Starts with the letter J. Jacob. Not Jeremiah. Nope. Joseph! <laughs> yeah, this is when um, Gabriel appeared to Joseph in a dream, or when the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. And um, 
And so we're going to read um, Matthew 2, 13 through 15. And this is on a, you're going to understand why this um, mosaic is there in just a moment. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. And um, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now here is biblical truth of Joseph, Mary's, and Jesus' stay in Egypt. We are not provided a lot of detail of their time in Egypt. In Matthew 2, 19, Matthew records that when Herod died, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream again, instructing him to return to Israel with Mary and Jesus. This is another mosaic that can be found in one of the churches. So this mosaic clearly is showing Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus either traveling to Egypt or leaving Egypt. So why have these mosaic, mosaics installed here in these churches? Coptic tradition states that St. Sergius Church is sitting on the site where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus lived when they were in Egypt. And I don't know if there's a, a sign, Jesus slept here in the building. Um, but um, th that's, that's, that's what they will tell you, is that this is the site where, where they lived. And I can tell you with a great deal of certainty, they have no idea whether Jesus was there or not. And I suspect the claim was made to try to make the church pure authentic. And this happened... Um, frequently um, back in those days trying to attach the name of an apostle or the name of a gospel writer to a, a location uh, to make it uh, appear authentic. Um, but that's not the end to the claims about St. Sergius Church and Joseph's family. It's also claimed that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus were accompanied, accompanied to Egypt with a midwife named Salome. And apparently there is a cave of some sort underneath St. Sergius Church, which is where they claim Joseph and his family lived while in Egypt. And I didn't put, have this mosaic up on the screen, but there's a mosaic showing the baby of Jesus being lowered down into the cave um, on a rope pull, you know, on a pulley. So there's no proof whatsoever that there was a midwife with them or that they lived in a cave or that they lived anywhere close to this site. Um, maybe it helps tourism. And, um, but um, traditions are not only associated with St. Sergius, but it's also claimed that Ben Ezra Synagogue is the location where baby Moses was found by Pharaoh's daughter. Two events happening in, within a 20-acre area. Um, everyone seems to want to put their building um, in the limelight. So let's move on to some of the teachings of the um, Coptic Church. Now, I, I think some of you are aware that there's an Egyptian Coptic Church here in Murfreesboro. Um, ironically and, and, and sadly, it occupies the old Bellwood Church Christ facility. And um, so what is the Coptic Church? And how did Christianity get started in Egypt? Now, before going into this, I, I, I'll tell you up front, I, Generally, I'm sort of skeptical of what I read about politicians, about religions, because people will write anything. But most of the information I did get came from a, a, a Coptic priest in Cairo and from a Coptic church in, in Philadelphia. Again, take, take all this for a grain of salt, but I, I take it as probably probably close, and the two uh, seem to agree with each other. But well before the first century, going back several hundred years, many Jews migrated to Egypt for various reasons. 
Some left Israel f to, um, for Egypt to escape conquering armies such as Babylon. And if you need to take uh, the Lord's Supper tonight, it's available in um, 105 down the hall. No, it's, it's one of the rooms down the hall. 105? Okay, thank you. And some left to escape conquering armies um, such as Babylon. When they came in, um, Jews fled um, um, the Promised Land and took refuge in Egypt. Some Jews were sold into slavery. That wasn't too unusual. Um, others may have relocated to Egypt for um, job possibilities, for prosperity. And even though Egypt was not the empire it was in the day of Moses, there were still many opportunities for skilled laborers. And I think it's quite conceivable that when Joseph arrived in, in Egypt, he had work to do. He was a carpenter. And um, he would have had opportunity to get into the building trades when he was in Egypt. It was the Egyptian ruler Ptolemy II who commissioned the Hebrew language Old Testament be translated into the Greek language. Um, this uh, translation is known as the Septuagint, and we occasionally see Jesus quoting from the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, by the time of the first century, there was a sizable Jewish population in Egypt, um, Joseph and Mary likely would have been living around other Jews while in Egypt. And it was only natural that when the church began on the day of Pentecost, that New Testament Christians began to teach their Jewish brethren in Egypt the good news of Jesus and his church. They were evangelistic. And when Saul started persecuting the church and Christians fled to Jerusalem, no doubt many Jewish Christians sought refuge in Egypt, taking the gospel with them. The church in Egypt started as a babe in Christ. It was immature, and although they were being taught the pure gospel of Christ, inevitably false teachers would soon be knocking at the door. The Bible does not specifically address the error that was being that crept into the Egyptian churches, but the Bible does address errors that made its way into the Jerusalem church and the churches in Gentile countries. There were Judaizing teachers that taught that one had to be circumcised in order to be and, and according to the law of Moses, keep certain feast days and refrain from certain foods. The Apostle Paul fought against such teachings. Um, skip over. Uh, I better get into that. The Apostle John had to refute the false teachings of some Gentile Christians who taught that Jesus really did not come to the, um, to the earth and the flesh. Another variation of error being taught by these false teachers that Jesus was born just as we were, were, are, were, not of a virgin, but by a man and a woman. At Jesus' baptism, they taught that Christ inhabited the body of Jesus, and he lived a righteous life for three years. But before being crucified, they teach that Christ left the body of Jesus, and it was just a man that was crucified. It is against this backdrop that the Coptic Church had its beginnings. While the churches in Italy, Greece, and Turkey continued to devolve, uh, the Egyptian church rose in opposition to the error being taught in the European Gentile churches. And while they were correct to oppose some of the Gnostic teachings of the Gentile Christians, they too succumbed to some of the same errors being taught elsewhere. The claim of the European church was that the Apostle Peter was the first pope. Of course, we know that's not the case. But not to be outdone, the Egyptian church, also known as the Coptic church, claimed that the gospel writer Mark was their first pope. They claimed that Mark started a divinity school in Alexandria and forcefully proclaimed the gospel. I have no doubt that Mark would have proclaimed the gospel as it should be taught, and it is possible Mark spent time in Alexandria teaching and preaching. However, I cannot imagine that Mark would have ever acknowledged or accepted the position of being a pope. The Coptic church as we have today was not formally started until 451, many, many years until after the death of Mark. And so this seems to be a case of historical claims being made in a rearview mirror. So 
So, um, other than having popes, bishops, dioceses, basilicas, and things of this nature, what else does the Coptic Church teach, and what are some of their customs and traditions? Well, they do practice baptism, but this is the way it works in the Coptic Church. Again, I'm somewhat skeptical of what I read, but this comes from two sources, the Coptic priest and the Coptic Church. They do teach that baptism is by immersion and that it is absolutely necessary for the forgiveness of sins. This is where any similarity to Coptic baptism and biblical baptism ends. But I'll hit a few highlights. And um, they teach that babies are to be baptized, not by sprinkling, but by immersion. Um, for male babies, they are to be brought to the church 40 days after they're born to be baptized. For female babies, it's 80 days. The mother of the baby is to accept faith in Christ on behalf of the baby. The mother stands barefoot on sheep fur in front of the baptismal font. Three kinds of oil are added to the water in the baptismal font. And before the baby is baptized, the mother must confess sin and be absolved by the priest. Several prayers are offered, and both the mother and the baby are anointed with oil in the sign of the cross. Then the mother completely undresses the baby and holds the baby in her right arm, points the baby towards the west. She then cites the reading, denouncing Satan three times. The priest offers several more prayers, and deacons read from the liturgies, and even a hymn is sung. You're up, Matt. And uh, finally, the priest takes the baby facing west and immerses the baby three times in the baptismal font. They baptize three times, once for the Father, once for the Son, and once for the Holy Spirit. After the baby is lifted out of the water the third time, the priest rolls the baby over on its stomach so any water in the baby's nose or mouth can drain out. If the baby is slow to begin breathing, the priest gently shakes him. <laughs> then the baby is returned to its mother. Because the baptismal water has sacred oil mixed in it, there are special instructions on what to do with the towel which the baby has dried. So how do they baptize adult converts? Adult converts are also immersed in the water three times. And just as babies are completely undressed for baptism, adults are also required to be completely undressed when they are baptized. For men, they privately undress and step into the baptismal water up to the neck, so their baptistry is, is taller than what we have. Then the priest comes in and plunges the man's head into the water three times. Then the priest leaves, and the man um, comes out of the water and, and dresses again. For women, a female attendant assists the woman to get undressed. Like the man, the woman steps into the water up to her neck. The priest then enters the water for the baptisms. And the instructions state that preferably the priest is separated from the woman by a curtain. The priest reaches through the curtain and dips the woman's head under the water three times. So you probably have learned more about Coptic baptism than you ever wanted to know. So briefly, here are some other beliefs and practices. Coptic Christians have seven fixed times to pray every day. When they pray, they are the pray facing east. When men, women pray, they are the wear a head covering. Eating meat that still has blood in it after cooking is discouraged, although there are no food or dietary restrictions um, for Coptic Christians. They fast um, nine hours prior to taking communion. They observe several other feast days. They fast every Wednesday and Friday. Some of the fasting they do is not a total fast. It's just an abstention from eating meat. Coptic Christians observe seven feast days, including Christmas, Palm Sunday, and Easter. I found it interesting that even Christmas is observed nationwide in, in Egypt which is predominantly Muslim, but Egypt is, is big over there. Like many Protestant denominations in the last 50 years, the Coptic Church has succumbed to many transformations. Um, they recently approved allowing women to serve as deacons. 
There have been meetings with the officials in the Roman Catholic Church to discuss reuniting with them. Um, they had the split about 500 A.D. Um, Pope Francis has added 21 Coptic Christians to the official martyrdom list. So how many Coptic Christians are there today? Estimates range from 8 million to 12 million. Um, but I've seen some higher numbers. Well, the bell has rung. I'm out of notes. You didn't have to sing tonight. <laughs> so, 